Thank you, Linda. And um, before we begin proceedings, I'd just like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And it's upon their ancestral lands that the Sydney Conservatorium is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices, we also pay respect and knowledge to the respect and knowledge embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of the country. And uh, when my colleague, colleagues from Boonaba country in Western Australia came to Sydney last year, uh, they were welcomed by Uncle Vic Sims from uh, an Eora Nation elder. And uh, they were welcomed to country just around the back here in the, in the Botanic Gardens. And that was a really special moment. Uh, Emmanuel and Dylan here, two of the, uh, two of the Boonaba cast members from Jundamara, they told me that they actually felt a bit uneasy being in Sydney until they were properly smoked up. And, uh, and once, they, once they had the smoking ceremony, uh, they, they felt much, much happier about that. So custodianship of country, survival of a people and the keeping of culture strong are actually really important themes of this project that we're going to talk about today. And I'd like to talk about the process of creation of this unique creative partnership that crosses traditions and cultures. And speaking of uh, welcomes to country, acknowledgements of country, I was welcomed to country here in Bunaba country in 2013. This is uh, in the middle of Winjana Gorge. Um, and this is Emmanuel who featured in the other, in the other photo there. And uh, here's our Jandamara. Um, so this is a really special thing that, that happened uh, at the beginning of, of the process. So I want to also acknowledge and thank the members of the Boonaba community in Western Australia for their partnership in this project, their generous access to cultural property and their willingness to share it with all Australians. Without their generosity, this project simply would not have happened. And really the fault in my talk today, and I'm going to acknowledge it, is not having a Boonaba voice to talk about the other side of the collaborative process. I can only talk about it from, from my perspective. Uh, we had home, hoped to, f to film one of the um, Boonaba community leaders, June Oscar. In fact, my, uh, my partner in crime here, Steve Hawke, did film June speaking about the collaborative process. Then he managed to wipe it in his car on the way back. And so we've got 15 minutes of footage of Steve listening to the radio. <laughs> so I'm sorry that we don't have that. I'm hoping that we might get, uh, get that refilmed and put it up on, uh, on the YouTube site at a later date. Okay, so what is Jandamara Sing for the Country? It's a dramatic choral work for large forces, including children's choir, large and small SATB choirs, solo baritone, actors, singers and dancers from the Boonaba community, and an orchestra. The subject matter is the late 19th century hero, John Damara, a Boonaba man who has helped ensure the survival of his people through a very violent era of conflict. It's a very famous story in Western Australia, but it's not so well known in the rest of the country. So more about our central character, John Damara, a bit later. So by way of introduction to the project, here is a little video put together by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, who was the major creative partner and presenter of this new work. It was great, yeah, the first time we first time we're here. That's my one of the Kimberley boys. And it's a, it's a privilege to be at in Sydney and come doing the performance about Jandamara. It's big and there's a lot of tunnels in there. It's like a maybe a one bit one bit hugging the tunnel, eh? Jandamara is a, a one of the Bonoba legend in the time. This go back right back in the eighteen uh, hundreds. Bonoba people identify intimately with him and are really proud to be able to tell his story. So it's, it's important to them as much as, as much or even more so than it's important to the country that, that this story is told and honoured. When, when I was first approached out of the blue by Paul Stanhope who told me he'd been commissioned and wanted to write a cantata 
and was interested in doing it about the Jandamara story, I said, what's a cantata? <laughs> I'm a non-musical person, um, but having had that explained to me by Paul and we talked through the concept and some ideas and some possibilities, look, we jumped at it, we embraced the thing. And I have to say in this, is, although I am the writer, I, it is not my story. I do not own this script or this libretto. It is owned by a company called Bunaba Cultural Enterprises, which employs me. This belongs to the Bunaba mob. It's dedicated to my mum, Hazel, who was passionate about the Kimberley and about the work that I do up there, but she was also passionate about the Sydney Symphony. That's one of the other beautiful, beautiful things about this project for me. I mean, she played with the symphony, she was a patron, she loved it. But it's also dedicated to two deceased Bunnibar elders, uh, Adam Andrews, who is the man who dreamed the Jumba, which forms a central part of this cantata, and many of his descendants are in the show with us and an old woman called Molly Jalak Beer, Jalak, who composed that beautiful, beautiful Dillery Lament, which forms the basis of the second last song of the cantata. I didn't get a chance to play Jandamara from the, the first couple of theatre play we did. And yeah, it's, it's an honour for, for me to play, to maybe make the Bonobo people happy. I'd like to thank everybody, and, as we, and even the performers from uh, Children Choir, and right down to the uh, orchestra band, and like, we like, to me, I see it like a family, big family, trying to achieve that goal, and and we so far we got it, yeah. What I can see here, it's a lesson that both of us, the European people and Aboriginal people, can learn from this. It's a sad story, but we can put that behind. Go forward, sharing this big white brown land between black and white. And we are doing that slowly, right, right here at the Opera House. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an introduction to the kind of the size and the scope and what, what it looked like at, at least, although we didn't hear very much of what it sounds like um, as yet. So how does a, a work like this happen? I mean, it seems miraculously, mir miraculous to me now looking back at that and looking at some of the images that, that it actually happened. Um, well, I guess it, it first started with a phone call from the Sydney Symphony Orchestra who called me late in 2010, asking me would I write a piece for the Gondwana Choirs Group, um, and specifically the National Indigenous Children's Choir, which is a, a new group that Lynn Williams, their director, there's a picture of Lynn there, um, had, had started up. And she was particularly interested in, in having pieces sung in language. And this sounded like a, a fantastic project to me. I've worked with Lynn and her choirs for long periods of time, and the collaborations have always been really joyful, fulfilling ones. Um, so it was a kind of dream come true. But my problem then was, what on earth is this piece going to be? Uh, this wasn't an easy problem to solve either. So fortunately, uh, one day while on, on holidays, and I must have just been sick of listening to the wiggles with the kids or something, and I, I had uh, <laughs> Margaret Throsby on the radio. I hardly ever listened to Margaret Throsby on the radio, I have to say. Uh, but anyway, I just happened to hear this interview on Classic FM uh, with this guy with his broad Australian accent talking about the play of Jandamara. And I was fascinated by this and, and the, the story which I had never heard of before and the, also the, the collaborative process behind the, uh, the play which Stephen was talking about was also really interesting. It seemed to me that this was a really compelling story and, and it might be able to be adapted into a sung work. I would initially thought something like six songs about Jandamara well, the piece ended up being quite a lot more ambitious than that. So the, the piece had its antecedent in this play of Jandamara. And this was tremendously important uh, because it, it sped up aspects of the process that otherwise may have taken years and years. So for example, we already had, oh, I'll just sorry, go back a, a slide. Um, we, already, we already had Bunaba cast members who had gained experience in acting. They're intimate of, with the story. 
uh, much of the structure and the content of the cantata version was already there in the play. There was also a very strong relationship, 30 years long, between the Bunaba community and the librettist, Steve Hawke. And that helped facilitate the negotiation for a new version. Um, so yeah, beginning from scratch would have taken so much, so much longer. So just to give you a bit of an idea of what is the story of Jandamara for those of you who, who don't know it. So it's a story set in, in the late 18, 17, 1780s, rather, uh, 1880s and 1890s, I've made a mistake there, late 19th century. Um, and this is from a, a little children's book, Jandamara by Mark Greenwork, Wood and Terry Denson. So Jandamara grew up in pretty troubled times and uh, he was working as a tracker with um, one, of the, one of the troopers. Um, he'd spent, Jandamara had spent some time in jail already. It had a very disrupted childhood. There was invasion of traditional lands. Um, all sorts of chaos starting to happen within Bordeaux country. Um, Jandamara worked as a tracker, rounding up his own people. He was a bad guy. He was working for the enemy in a sense. He was also incredibly successful at what he did. And if he had kept going, his whole community probably would not have survived. In a very risky move, the chief elders of the Bunaba nation, including Jandamara's uncle Ilamara, allowed themselves to be captured and brought into prison. And in a very risky move, they tried to get him to change sides. And the way that we tell it in the cantata is it, he has sung home. He is in this magical incantation song. He has sung day and night to, to change his view, to take an action. And the action is to shoot the trooper, his mate Richardson, and to free his own people. So Jandamara does change sides and he is brilliant at it. He becomes a resistance fighter and he leads the charge. His intimate knowledge of country, his uh, skills as a marksman, as a, as a, a great horseman, uh, he kind of is able to combine skills and fight off in a fantastic resistance for about three years where his people get to go and live as of days of old. There is an enormous gun battle Battle of Wingena Gorge. And it's the, the biggest civilian gun battle in Australia's history. Not many people know about it. It was incredibly bloody and violent. And Jandamara was, was injured during this gun battle. Um, but the white troopers couldn't track him down. So eventually they brought in Mingo Mick, who was a man of power, he was a man of culture from the Pilbara, who was also put in a terrible position his family were, were held in prison and he was told to go and hunt down Jandamara or his family would be killed. So the tracker is tracked down eventually and he is killed in Tunnel Creek, a place where he hid out. And this, this last slide here, we are still here and still strong. That's one of the chief messages of the cantata and it's one that the Bunaba people really want to emphasise and really want to celebrate. So, in 2012, the working out of the structure of this cantata began. So the task was to condense a three-hour play into about 60 minutes of music. So prose went into a mixture of sung poetry and small amounts of spoken narration and dialogue. This required a complete rewrite of the material into a libretto. And in doing this, Steve also explored more of the metaphorical elements of the story in parallel to the historical-based narrative. Some creative license was also taken with the historical side in order to present an artistic statement. And this was an important thing that we consulted with the community members in order to make this artistic statement. Now, throughout the process of the libretto, three uh, three women, important women in the Bornaba community were, were consulted. Uh, we've got here Mona Oscar, who is June's mum, and Patsy Bedford, who is one of the, 
the narrators and actors in the, the Jandamara cantata. She also appeared as Jandamara's mother in the play. So these wonderful women went through the, both the play and then later then cantata version line by line just to check that what we were doing met with approval and also uh, we got consultation about including Bunaba language. There's quite a bit of Bunaba language in, in the cantata script. And a little photo uh, down the bottom of me with June there. And we met up in, in Sydney uh, during the launch of the Cantata project. And uh, we talked uh, every now and then about um, Bunaba language aspects. And when I needed new words, she would uh, send them through. So although um, there wasn't quite the level, level of collaboration in the script writing as there was in the play, there was a lot of consultation throughout the process. So Bunaba country, some of you may know the Kimberley region. Um, and Bunaba land is around Fitzroy Crossing and where it says the King Leopold Ranges, sort of in the middle uh, of, of the King Leopold Ranges is Bunaba country, <coughs> Winjana Gorge. And uh, so that's, that's traditional lands. And the, the, the t chief town is Fitzroy Crossing. So between the uh, Winjana Gorge site and Fitzroy Crossing, um, I made four, four journeys uh, over a two year period. So the first of those journeys was in April 2013. And uh, this is Tunnel Creek. This is one of the important sites for the Jandamara story. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic complex of, of caves which goes underneath the King Leopold Ranges. And the, the entrance is virtually hidden. There are fresh springs. And this is where Jandamara hid out to heal himself when he was shot. And this is coming out the other side of the ranges. It's, it's quite an extraordinary site. If you ever get to go to the Kimberleys, I, I really strongly urge you to go and, and visit Tunnel Creek, especially if you can arrange a tour with Dylan and his family who do tours here and you get the unique cultural insight. This is Bandalngan or Winjana Gorge and we camped at the foot of, of these cliffs here and Jandamara uh, used some of these as fortresses, um, fantastic vantage points to see for miles and miles. We set up camp over about three days we talked things through. Dylan was very keen for me to soak up the country. I had my initiation into the, uh, into the culture here, into the smoking ceremony, I should say, and was taken up to see some very special, special paintings up at the, the back of the gorge that, um, that normally visitors don't get allowed to do. So I felt very, very privileged that I was allowed that opportunity. Um, we sat side by side drinking tea, Steve talked about the components about this new version involving the Sydney Symphony and Gondwana choirs. As you can imagine, there were, there were plenty of questions from the families involved. There were about five families who turned up to uh, participate in this. Why do we need an orchestra? How many of us will get to travel to the Opera House? Can we, travel, can, can we trust this mob with our story? Good questions. So we also talked about the use of three verses of a Junba song line, which was owned by Adam Andrews, as Steve mentioned in that little film before. And we had an antecedent in Jandamara play where the Junba and Wonga songs were also used. And these were good starting points to begin the discussion of what a cantata would be. We had a kind of a music rich basis to begin with. We also had a draft legal agreement uh, prior to, to the visit, so we all got lawyered up. And um, so we had this in Whitefella law, but that's only one component. Uh, if the community then doesn't, doesn't want to engage with this, there's, there's no point in having a legal document. So it was really about talking this through side by side, talking about what the elements of this is going to be. There's also a chance for me to meet some of the proposed members of the cast. And also it was important for me to know who the right people were to sing the songs and who are the people with the rights to, to dance the dances? These are very important questions. And these have got nothing to do with me. These have got to do, it's got to do with the Bunaba community. They have to sort those things out. And we left them to make those important decisions. 
and we did whatever they wanted to do. So in saying this, I'm not trying to make any sort of universal process clear. I don't think there is a universal process. I think each project needs to find a unique way to negotiate such things, but built on foundations of respect and consultation and asking who are the right people to ask the right questions is kind of the foundation. I was so very lucky to have Steve to help negotiate me through um, these quite tricky areas. So just as a summary of this consultation process, visiting the community for consultation, having a legal agreement set up, which is also a copyright agreement too. So the Boonaba uh, Cultural Enterprises share half the copyright of, of this piece. The royalties, small though they are, flow back to the community. Um, and then the Sydney Symphony Orchestra also signed off on this as well. So there was further consultation throughout the composition process to ensure that all the material was used in a respectful way and with the permission of the correct Boonaba owners of the cultural property. So by July 2013, we had a first draft of a libretto and it was time to get started on the work. So we had a number of, of musical sources that I, I mentioned. And first of these, the Lirga Wonga. So Wonga doesn't actually come from the Kimberley. It's actually imported or has traveled from the Northern Territory into Kimberley. And uh, there was one particular um, Wonga that was used in the Jandamara play and um, everyone was very keen for it to be in, in the, the cantata version too. So Wonga is a public dance song and it is didgeridoo accompanied. So this is quite, un it's unlike some of the Kimberley music that we have in the, in the rest of the, the cantata. Um, and there's a, a brilliant um, a publication by Alan Marrett about Wonga and uh, um, I encourage you to have a look at that if you're interested. So this wonga we use to underline Jandamara as a man of culture and power right at the beginning of the cantata. And I'll just give you a, um, a little excerpt from that. <laughs> Okay, it's only very brief. We do it, we do it uh, twice more in the, in the cantata. So the next excerpt is from a different genre. This is called Junba. And Junba is a, a genre of storytelling song from the Kimberley. It's performed with sticks and voice without didgeridoo. And the particular Junba that we used uh, was dreamt up by Adam Andrews, who's Dylan Andrews' father. And it's a, it's a song story about two rainbow serpents, or unguds, who uh, appeared in a dream. And uh, this is an extended cycle of songs, and we use uh, three excerpts from it. The first of these is called the Winjui verse. And I'll just play you a little bit of this. Okay, so that's just a little field recording that I did in my, my first trip there. And uh, we used this verse in conjunction with children's choir to underline a particular dramatic moment called Requiem for Lindsay. Um, a young white boy disturbs the snake spirit in the spring where he shouldn't have gone and he, and he drowns. And so we have both the Junba and elements of, of a Latin Requiem sung simultaneously. This 
son paid the price for spawning Ilumidi Wungut, that snake spirit. Okay, so each of these, these excerpts of Indigenous music is used for a particular dramatic purpose in telling the story. And the third one here is a Darari lament. That's what Steve mentioned uh, in the little film. It's, uh, uh, the Bunaba text is uh, about a mother black cockatoo who is grieving at the loss of her baby. And it's used as a metaphor for grief at the loss of Jandamara. His mother, Ginny, sings this song after Jandamara is killed. And this little song by Molly Jalakbia Jalak um, is in custodianship by June Oscar and Patsy Bedford, and uh, they're both intimately involved in the creation of, of this work, and they've given permission to use it here. So this is Patsy Bedford singing um, a little bit of the Durari Lament, and then you can hear that the, that the music is then taken up by the other ensembles, um, choirs and orchestra. So that's just an excerpt of the Dirari Lament. Um, the next stage in the composition process was actually to get some dots on page. So as the first draft compositions, four movements were done mainly in vocal score, vocal and piano, and then these were workshopped, a number of these movements were workshopped in November 2013. Um, and important ones such as the, the Requiem uh, mixed together with the Junba I recorded both of those things separately, mixed them together, and then took them up to Fitzroy Crossing a little bit later in December and played them to members of the, of the community and said, is this okay, can we do this? And they listened to it a couple of times and said, yes, we really like what you're doing there, keep going. Uh, phew. <laughs> I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't had that. Uh, done something else, I guess. So we also had to check things such as the Junba pitch, you know, where's the best, best place for it to be? And is it fixed or removable? And we found out that F sharp was its happiest home. So there's a lot of F sharp in the, in the cantata. Uh, we had some further permission conversations with the extended Andrews family and just kind of show things didn't go completely smooth sailing. There was a, a bit of spanner, a few spanners in works and the other side of the Andrews family were completely happy with the whole idea of this cultural property being used in this way. They're members of the family as well. Why, why weren't we consulted? And of course, families being 
families, sometimes members of the family don't talk to each other, and this is what happened. So it, it was an, a lesson to all of us, and despite Steve's extensive experience, um, that things are complicated. And, uh, you know, extra time for consultation, there's never sort of too much time. So fortunately, we're able to talk all the issues through and, uh, and, and everyone in the end was satisfied that we could continue. So the next phase, composition continues and in January, I recorded the Durari Lament in the choral version and uh, this was during a, a summer school and uh, then sent that uh, through to June and Patsy uh, to make sure that they were happy with what, what we were doing with that. And they said, yes, you can keep going. First orchestrations begin, and we also needed to start doing some rewrites of the libretto. We realised that it was just too long, and um, it, was, it was going to be massively long. We didn't start doing some cuts. In April 2014, uh, we had a further choral workshop by the Sydney, Sydney Chamber Choir this time, and some recitative sections workshopped by baritone Alex Knight, and these recordings helped facilitate the next stage, it's a cantata script walkthrough uh, up, to, up at Fitzroy Crossing this time. And we can see this is, we've got some portable stereo equipment and uh, we've got EJB, Emmanuel Brown, holding his stick for, for the gun. We just used the same sticks in the, uh, in the show. And you wouldn't believe the, um, uh, the rigmarole it takes to actually get fake weapons on the stage of the Sydney Opera House, even when they're sticks. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so here's some more shots of that rehearsal camp. I was just playing through little bits of, the, of this particular movement because there are cues that, the, um, that the, the musicians needed to learn. And this is uh, one of the movements where the dancers come on stage. Here's Steve talking through the process of what the script is. We did a big read through of the entire script we walked it through, and then the end of it, everyone just sat down and someone spoke up and said, can we do it again? So we did. It was starting to get dark, and there was another request, can we do it again? So we did it again, and I think that was tacit approval that what we were doing was okay. Um, and it was a really good sign that we knew that we had everybody on board. And there's just some more, uh, more photos one up the top there is um, just some rehearsals of, of some of the, the dancers. Uh, it's, it's their dancers, they, they don't belong to us. So um, the Bunaba uh, dancers here were, were organising themselves there. Um, the picture down the bottom is Phil Thompson, who is our visual director. He had worked with the, the same, same members of the, of the cast in the, Jandamara, in the second season of the Jandamara play. They all really liked to work with, with Phil, so it was natural to, to bring him back um, to work with them again. And it was a very successful thing, having that continuity between the play and, um, and the cantata version. Okay, and by this time, the piece um, was, was finished in, in score. I didn't have a weekend between February and June. I worked through every, every weekend to get it, to get it done. Um, uh, miraculously, my family was sp still speaking to me. And, uh, and then at the end of this, we had a, a delightful opportunity to go up to Wingena Gorge again um, for some pre-show rehearsals and publicity. This was, this was funded uh, thanks to Tourism WA, and it was um, filmed for the 7.30 report. And um, I'll just play you a little bit of this, this clip on the 7.30 report. And just for the very last, last bit, because we're running out of time, I just want to talk a little bit about one of the scenes in Jandamara and some of the, the, the elements which we, we frankly struggled to pull together. But in the end, we, we found that we had what we think is a, a good solution. So this scene called The Choice is very crucial in the whole telling of the story. Um, and it's one where, the, one where Jandamara is sung into action by this incessant magic song, forcing him to make a choice. 
And uh, through the singing of this incantation, day and night, the captured men get inside Jandamara's head, forcing him into action, killing the trooper Richardson and setting them free. So putting this to music was, was quite challenging. And if it's not done well, then the scene can make Jandamara look callous. So the idea is to show that there is collective responsibility for this act, that the desperation of elders to sing him back into the fold um, is, is portrayed in this scene. So some of the, the musical elements that, that we had for this were, were the junba to kind of stand in for this magic song. And it's used, uh, we use a verse that mentions the old Limalaru prison where the men were captured. And I'll just play you a little bit of, of this, this verse. And at the very end of it, what we tried doing, it, well, what I tried doing was to loop the very end of the song so that other musical elements could be layered over the top of it and to give an illusion that the song is going and going and going, even though the, the, the singing stops and it's just a looped version of it. Yeah, so we had that recording from, uh, from the play, fortunately. It was a little studio recording. And we had that played on a sampler. And then the, uh, the singers sang along with that live as well. Now, the beauty of doing that was being able to control the volume of it and then layer other elements of sound on the top of that. And that's one of the things we had to, to uh, uh, rehearse in that riverbed up in Fitzroy Crossing. It was just the cues of when the singers come in. And, uh, and, and, and as you'll see on the, um, on the video clip that I'm about to show you, there are various cues of walking in and some, some dramatic elements as well. So this allowed a solo, some recitative sections sung by a solo baritone, uh, performed here by Simon Lobelson, to be able to sung over the top of that loop. And we also tried to amplify some of the psychological elements of this magic song through the layering of orchestral effects of choral layers, including a quite dramatic and visual, um, visual effect of using thigh slapping, as you'll see, orchestral clusters and other sorts of effects. Um, and the whole idea is that it's an immense build-up to this moment where John Damara shoots Richardson. So here it is to end with a section of John Damara Sing to the Country called The Choice.
that cursed song. From the sound of that cursed song, the song that was slowly sending him mad. He staggered up, seized his gun, advanced on Yili Mano. A spike fell threat to shut him up for good. Had no effect upon that body of wrong. Still the song, the song went on. Still the song went on. <laughs> Sorry? It's not up to me. If it was up to me, I would, it would be on every week. <laughs> yeah, uh, the problem, as you might gather, is expense. Yeah, we had $100,000 of, of sponsorship from the Kimberley Diamond, Diamond Company that, that uh, helped very much with that. Kimberley Diamond Company is now going broke. So unfortunately, that stream has, has dried up. Um, but we're hoping to bring together partners together in the future to try and uh, to, to mount another production. But it, it's, it's really up to a major organisation such as a festival or one of the orchestras to, to pull together the necessary partners to make it happen. Nolan Caves, right. It's a fantastic idea. If you've, if you've got someone with a big fat checkbook, let me know. And we'll, and we'll do it. We can, we can do it again. We'd love to do it again. It's, it's one of those things that uh, it, it's very much up to the presentation partners to be able to, uh, to do. We've got the skills built up. We've got the community ready to go and do it again. They're raring to go and we'd love to perform the piece again. And um, we've got a number of people in the audience tonight who are in the show last year in the choirs and uh, tremendously talented people. We'd love to do it again. So, so say it again, that sounds like a good question. How accessible was like attendance of the performance? Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Look, there, we had, um, there were a number of offers made uh, for comps and uh, other travel means for, for members of, uh, important community members to travel. So yeah, um, there was limited budget for it. Uh, the other way that the, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra was really great about doing this, they, they did a simulcast. 
to Bunaba country, uh, and they organised that through through Telstra, and they had a live feed so so people could watch it. And then we've also sent um, DVDs uh, so that that all community members can can access that. But it's a it's a really good point. Yep. <laughs> is, is, is Bob musical? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, look, Steve, Steve says he hasn't got a musical bone in his body. Um, he, take, he reckons he takes after his father like that. But, um, um, but he, he, he loves music, and uh, Steve's eldest son is a double bass player. So, you know, there's clearly some, some tradition through the family of, of music. And, uh, and so I think I'm, I'm winning... Winning Steve over to contemporary Australian music now, at least. <laughs> yes? Did you ever worry that the kind of Western harmony or the Western music that we're familiar with would overshadow the kind of African traditional music world? Did you feel like the Western elements were part of the, were a symbolic part of the story that you're trying to tell? Yeah, it's, it's the medium. Um, I mean, it would be disingenuous of me to be anything else but true to my tradition. Um, and uh, whether it overpowers something or not, that's a, a good question. We felt that we had a decent amount of balance in that Indigenous music got to stand by itself. Um, that was one of the examples of where of an integrated use of, of the Junba to underline a dramatic point. Uh, there are standalone movements just in sort of my choral orchestral style. And there are standalone movements um, of indigenous music. So, uh, look, that's that's an open question, um, and I guess it's up that's up to the, the list, every every listener to decide whether that's a success or not. Um, we were upfront with the community as to what this project was, and they were they were happy to to run with it like this. Matthew. Uh, this was. Yeah, so um, plays generally have lots of words. It's major, the major problem. Um, and lots of descriptive prose, lots of, lots of dialogue. Um, and it's, so it's, it, it's a matter of making into a, a libretto, getting things much more succinct, uh, cutting down concepts, finding ways to find different forms. So I was asking for a lot more strophic forms than what the, sort of the initial initial drafts that Steve came up with. Uh, our, some of our final versions were sort of much more verse chorus. Um, I kept asking for more rhymes. Um, so it was, it was a matter of, of getting a transformation of the style of the text into something that, that could be sung. Sorry. This project is obviously like very personal, it's tailored for these people. If the Bunaba people want to, yeah, that's right. So it's, it's very much up to um, our Bunaba partners uh, to decide whether they're going to give permission each time as to perform it. Um, and that's, that's part of, the, that's part of the, the project. I do get asked every now and then, couldn't we just, couldn't we just do it with choirs and orchestras without, uh, without our Indigenous cast? And clearly the answer is no. It's, it, it's very much about that partnership. And, and if we don't have that, then the integrity of the, of the project is lost in a way. Yep. Yes? Hi, I want to talk Yep. Yes, ownership and, and who has the right to, to tell something. Well, the, the Bunaba community in general owns that story. There's no particular family who has, has the rights to it. Um, and it's, it's more the, it's the Junba that is owned by, that song cycle is owned by specific families. But we do have uh, in Patsy Bedford, one of the recognized community leaders as one of the main narrators. 
Um, and uh, as a result, she, she's kind of got the community respect and she's an appropriate person to, to be in that role of, of narration. But that's, one of, that's a very good point. It's one of those questions that, that needs to be asked. So is this, a, is this an appropriate person to, to be in this role? And, um, and, you know, hopefully we got that right. Uh, not right now. <laughs> um, it, it, it depends on what is going to come up. Um, I'd love to do some more, but uh, um, let's wait and see. I, I think I, can, I can't manage one of these every year, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm afraid our time for the formal Q&A is coming to an end, but you're all invited to join us um, for some informal continuations of the discussion. I hope Paul will come and join us out there. Um, just to the left when you come out, there's some um, complimentary refreshments, so please stay and join the conversation. Next week, we have James Humberston uh, from our music education department, who's also a composer, going to be telling us about why 21st music education should lead all education, or perhaps it does lead all education already. Um, so please join me in thanking Paul for a terrific